I thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me here today. So let's let's move on. Um, so why do we need to screen for diabetic retinopathy? Just to brief on that, because we have 73 million individuals in India as of November 2018, and it's probably much more now. And if you think of actual numbers, if there are three people with, uh, I mean, diabetic retinopathy, you know, causes blindness. And if you have three people with diabetes, one out of those three has diabetic retinopathy. And if there are 10 people in this room here with diabetic retinopathy, one out of those 10 has vision threatening diabetic retinopathy, which means what? They have severe NPDR, PDR or macular edema. And I presume you all know what these terms mean. So there's a high risk of going blind. So how do we screen? We know that we can do a dilated fundus exam. So you could be trained to do it or an ophthalmologist could do it. Or you could take a retinal photograph, send it across to an ophthalmologist, they send the report back after a few days and then you send that to the patient. But that process takes time. So what are the challenges in screening today? Access to a retina specialist is a big challenge. If you refer a patient out to a different place, more than or less under 50%, just under 50% of patients actually go. The rest of them don't go. So a lot of them don't get their eye tested because they need to go somewhere else. If they have to get their pupil dilated, then they don't want to do it because they have to drive. And then it's difficult for all physicians to have expensive fundus cameras in their clinic to practice teleophthalmology. So what is the solution here? So there are two big problems. One is, do we have cost-effective fundus cameras available? Can they be operated by just about anyone? So can your office person, receptionist do it? And next, what do you do with these retinal images that you actually take? How will you use those images to help the patient and then to improve your practice? So these are the two things that we would look at. So to answer the first part, yes, we do have cost-effective fundus photography devices, fundus cameras. You could visit the Remedio stall and take a look at their fundus and phone camera. It's easy to use. You could take non-midriatic images, which are as good as midriatic images. So it solves some of the problems that we talked about, and it could be operated by anyone who gets trained for a couple of days. So it doesn't take a bachelor's degree in medicine to operate this phone. So you, all of you as physicians need to screen for diabetic retinopathy, otherwise the patient will go blind. But then what do you do with these photographs? So if you're not really trained to interpret the photographs, sending it out, then getting it back, that whole process takes time. You need to know an ophthalmologist who's willing to do that. What if you don't? So this is where artificial intelligence comes in. And today, technology in the last few years has advanced so much that computers are able to help doctors to take decisions. So what these algorithms do is they get trained over thousands of images over time from databases and it's able to pick up patterns in the retina to identify what is a normal retina and what is an abnormal retina. So it's like a face recognition algorithm. Then based on patterns that it has learned as abnormal, when you feed in the retinal image of a new patient, it can give a diagnosis and say, okay, this patient has retinopathy or this patient has a normal retina. So there are several companies which have been working on this over the last few years and this monitor went off, but that's fine. And Google is one of them. <laughs> IDX was the first one approved by the FDA last year. There's also INUC. There may be one or two others as well. And most of these algorithms look at sensitivity of diabetic retinopathy for referable diabetic retinopathy, which is moderate NPDR or more severe diabetic retinopathy. But the biggest problem, even though one is FDA approved, the others are not, but the biggest challenge that we have in India or other developing sites is that we don't always have access to high speed internet, which is required to operate these softwares and to get back immediate reports. So there is a turnaround time. So this brings us to the next problem. What solution is there that can work without internet, without cloud? Because these algorithms work such that you have to upload the image onto an online uh, web server. So this is where I will be talking about the Medios AI. And the Medios Technologies is a company in Singapore, and we've been working with them and Remedios, which the fundus camera I just showed you a few minutes back, 
and we've been helping them develop this AI algorithm to diagnose, art, uh, to diagnose diabetic retinopathy over the last two years. So what this software does is if you could take a fundus image of a patient and put it into the software, within 30 seconds, without the need of internet, no Wi-Fi, it gives a report whether the patient has retinopathy or does not. It can take midriatic and non-midriatic images. So here you see on this part of the screen, there are heat maps. And then you actually see the retinal image. If you were closer, you'd see the actual areas with the hemorrhages and the exudates. And on the other image there, you see no heat map. So when the report comes out to the physician, it actually tells the physician, these are the areas where your patient has diabetic retinopathy. Then in a normal photo, it's all in green versus red. And there are no heat maps saying that, meaning there's no disease. So you have actual proof to tell the patient, this is the area where there's a pathology in your eye. Take this, go back and see your ophthalmologist. So what it does for you is you're giving more uh, overall comprehensive care. You're referring patients in a timely manner to the ophthalmologist when required. And there you're preventing blindness. The revenue part, I'll come right at the end because that was a part of the title of the symposia. So before that, let's look at evidence. So this is all fine, but to what extent, to what extent do these algorithms actually work? and how accurate are they? Because that's equally important for us as well. So I'll start off with the first study that was done at Dr. Mohan's place in Chennai using this particular algorithm. And they found that the sensitivity for referable di uh, diabetic retinopathy was 96%. And for severe NPDR and PDR, which is a step higher, it was 100%. So this was a start. So we knew that we're picking up a good enough number of cases of diabetic retinopathy when we screened individuals with diabetes. And then a second study happened subsequently, and this has been accepted at JAMA and is going through the final edits and will come out in a few months. This was at Aditya Joel Hospital in Mumbai by Dr. Natarajan, a vitreo retinal surgeon. Some of you here might know him. They're all from Maharashtra. So he, there they found that in individuals with diabetes, the sensitivity for referable diabetic retinopathy was 100%, um, and then the specificity was 88.4%. So this was also a result which reconfirmed that they were missing too many cases of patients who actually had disease. So we did another study in Bangalore in association with the Retina Institute of Karnataka and where we took images and these previous studies had taken images, uh, two images per eye from the patients and we decided to take three images per eye. And we did this in about 300 patients and we spoke about this in ATTD earlier this year. So we found that the sensitivity for referable diabetic retinopathy was 98.8% and for sight-threatening diabetic retinopathy, which is severe NPDR, PDR and macular edema, it was 100%. So there was a very less chance of the patient actually having um, almost vision-threatening or almost the chance of going blind and it not being picked up by the software. Yes, the specificity was lower. What does that mean? It probably means there are a few false positives but that's okay. That only means you're going to probably refer a few extra patients to the ophthalmologist and they'll come back and say, it's okay, these guys are normal and you don't have to worry about them. So it's always better to have a higher sensitivity for a screening test. So then we did another study because these were all small studies in about 200 to 300 patients in the first three studies. So we wanted to see what happens if you do this in a wider number of people and we presented this at ADA this year. So we did a study on 900 patients with diabetes and we thought, okay, all this while we've been looking at midriatic images. So what happens if we don't dilate the retina and what happens to the accuracy then? So people who want to drive, is this algorithm going to work as well? And this we believe is the largest study testing the performance of an AI algorithm using non-midriatic retinal images offline. And what did we find? We found that the sensitivity for referable diabetic retinopathy was 93%. For sight-threatening diabetic retinopathy, it was 95%. But there were also three patients in that group who had undergone PRP, that is panretinal photocoagulation, and they had no active DR changes. So the ophthalmologist had marked it as DR because they had undergone laser, but there were no active changes because the treatment had been successful. So when we did a sensitivity analysis and took those three cases out, then we found that the sensitivity for sight threatening DR went up to 98.7%. So this was a learning point for us that the algorithm cannot pick up laser marks. So that is something to remember. 
So I would come to the end of the summary of these two studies and point out that we have technologies that are going to assist us in the future. So we do have cost effective fundus cameras available today which can take undilated good quality images. We do have AI algorithms today which work online on the iPhone. They can give you the reports immediately and you can refer the patient to an ophthalmologist when you spot that the patient has a disease. And these studies have told us that. And we also, I would also like to point out that the results here, the sensitivity and the specificities that I actually mentioned from the different studies, these are higher than the FDA mandated cutoff, which is actually 85%. All of these, it was above 95%. So this has possibly, this also, once it goes through the regulations and so on, it'll be easier to get into use in other countries in the world. And this can open up markets for DR screening as this is accessible and cost effective. However, what do we need? Yes, we need further validation because we always learn more and more over time. So we need larger studies, we need multi-center studies. And the next process that we're also working on is grading of retinopathy. Because at this point, all we have is a binary diagnosis, DR present or DR absent. But the next thing is to see, can we have a mild NPDR, moderate NPDR, severe NPDR? That is something we're working on at this point and we'll see where it goes. We hope that there will be consistent accuracy and reproducibility across studies as we move ahead, but time will tell us. So the current ways to detect diabetic retinopathy that most people have followed for the last five years or 10 years or for maybe longer than that, uh, dilating, sending patients to an ophthalmologist, then waiting to get the patients back or patient never going to the ophthalmologist. All these current ways are perfect, but that's for a different world. That world is not us. So for our world, we need artificial intelligence and we need scalable cost-effective technologies that we can employ in our clinic, which can make screening affordable. So I would request all of you to join us and reduce the burden on the ophthalmologist. How will this change your revenue? I think the best example of that would actually be Dr. Neeta Deshpande. And I will ask her to say a few words later on because she has been using this device for a while in her practice and I was told that she has more footfalls in the clinic, patients come back, and then it's left to the treating doctor to figure out what they want to charge for the patient for the test. After all, you are providing a service for the patient. So if you're in Bangalore, maybe you would charge somewhere between 200 to 300 rupees. I also hear people in Mumbai are charging between 700 to 800 rupees. What does the AI company take out of it? 50 rupees, so the rest is with the doctor. So you can figure out in your practice, how much you want to charge for the patient. So thank you very much. And these are all the hospitals who have been a part of doing various clinical trials using the AI and the camera. So thank you.